Were we able to go through the um, guns and style transfer? I was able to go through the guns, although I didn't really go through the style transfer. So I have a question from the guns. Oh, okay, okay. Um, what's the time? I think we should start now. So yeah, what was the question? Okay. Um, doing the training of the model, okay, the codes for it. I noticed that we had to generate a fake image for the generator and also generate a fake image for the discriminator. So I wanted to know why we had to generate for discriminator too. Oh, okay. You know, you know, both of them, like I said, even though they help each other in terms of development. Okay. The, the, you know, as you keep training the discriminator, what you want the discriminator to be able to do is to be able to um, identify fake images so that's why we're using that generator network to generate fake images. And we already have the original images, which is the data set we are passing into the network. So that is the actual image. So the reason why we are generating for both sides is that we're trying to update the, um, the network. You know, if you, if you notice, it's still the network we're passing it through. And definitely the weights for the generator are in that network. So you can use it, you use it to generate fake images for the generator side, where you want to check how bad it is. But that is also what we are using to train the discriminator. Do you remember that I said that like both of them, as you keep going through each of the epochs, we are trying to make the generator to generate real images, and as well as making the discriminator know the difference between those fake generated images and the actual images. So that's why we are using the generator to generate the images that the discriminator used to do fake images. Do you get? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got what you're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but the whole point is that like they are just trying to make sure that both sides are learning concurrently. You know, if we use the same image generated for the first time, that you know where we started, like the first report, if you used, if you kept on using that generator state, the discriminator won't get better at all. Okay, now I get. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I understand now. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, Sadiq. Um, okay, I think we should go to um, go straight to what we have for today. So we're supposed to start um, deep learning for natural language processing. So more like um, finding how we can use deep learning to solve issues related to text data. If you've noticed somewhere, like when you start with machine learning, we are working with structured data. So structured data are basically data that are in form of tables or in a structured manner where you have um, each of your columns as the features, then the examples as the rules. That's more like structured data. But when they talk about unstructured data, they're talking about things like images, text, data. So those things, you can't really structure them. You have to find some ways to, to, make, them, um, to make them fit to go through the network. So for images, we already discussed how we could do that by using convolutional neural networks. So the convolution aspect of it is for generating features and then passing things to our network based on the features that are generated. So for today, we're going to like just introduce how we can process text data. First of all, so that's like the first one. That's basically what we're going to do today. But it's supposed to be taught by someone that's forever. I don't know if you know whoever is, but she has something to do today. So um, I'm going to go through a particular dance the notebook that explains how we can use um, 
like different methods. Yeah. They're just procedures, you know, how to process this text data to be able to pass um, it into the network. You know, definitely we can't just pass text into um, the network. We have to find a way to extract features from the text and pass it. So. Okay, so yeah, so this this is the notebook here. Hope everyone can hear me well, and I hope everyone can see it soon. Let me try. Yeah, we can hear you and play. Okay, so this is the notebook from that's this nano degree. So there are different things I'm going to do. Even though we have not really had experts in this side when it comes to text, but I'll try my best to explain it as much as I can. These are just the different steps that, we, um, that they, they went through. And I will just start with this one. So first of all, the data sets we're working with is the um, reviews data set. So more like a movie review, I've not really said it. Yeah, it's a movie review data set. So it contains different reviews, just like um, I, I, MBD, or Netflix review, something like that. So they contain different sentences by people. So those sentences are reviews and those reviews have their sentiment. So the sentence is either positive or negative sentiment. So basically this task is to predict which one is, um, which one of those sentences um, is negative or positive, something like that. So the, the whole essence of this, the whole essence of this particular um, the whole essence of this particular notebook is to make us familiar with how to process this text. So it's more it's not really more of the it's not really more of the neural network side. Even though we're going to look at how you can train the neural network, but it's going to put us through how we can convert um, the text data into things that are worth feeding into the neural net. So. The first thing to do is to first load our text data. So this um, this function here, if you can see, it, it takes in a variable i. So the variable i is like an index. So we can then print the particular index from the review side and from the label side. I think the first thing to do is to load both of them. So this particular side is to load them from two different TXT files. So if I like list this directory, you can see that these are the two text files, the labels for each um, for each review and review itself. So that's it over there. So we can load it using Python like this. So this is how we can load it. So open text file. So if I run this, you can then see each of the reviews and print it so you can see. Reviews. So this. Okay, it doesn't seem arranged, but they're actually in terms of indexes. So I'll just look through it for a few. Reviews, prints, um, reviews, prints, um, I. Okay, so you can see, I think I should separate this one by. Okay, so you can see it here. So this is like the first review there. The rather based on index, the first one, the second one, the third one, and so on. So these are the different reviews. So the whole point what we're going to do here is to try and get features. So you know if you're giving a sentence now, so even as human beings, there are ways to which we can know 
sentiments based on specific words. So if you say things like um, brilliant, best, um, love, and there are many other things, good, and most of all these things are things that determine the sentiment. So when you see things like this, you can almost predict that this is going to be a positive um, review. Then if you see things like lacked, um, there are some things that there are very there are some very key things that can make you know if something is um, negative. So I'm looking for one that is very obvious. Mm, okay, I can't seem to find anyone. But the thing is that they are just certain keywords in most of these sentences that can make you know the sentiment. So those are the things that we're going to make use of and pass it as text input into our data set, rather into our network. So this is just an example of this just a view of what it's like. Then the length of the reviews. So we have 25,000 um, reviews. So this is the first one. We already went through stuff like this. Then this is the label for that particular one. So this means the positive review. So they're already labeled, so we don't need to do the label. So this is the function we created earlier. So this just shows some, um, a few words in the particular review and straight to the labels, so you can see it. So there are some key things I'm going to do, but we'll just highlight some of the things that we would need or we'll go through it. So there's this function in Python called counter. So what counter does is that it's and um, he kind of creates a dictionary with specific functions. I'm not really going to go into that, but just know that we're going to count the positive words, the negative words, that's the, the number, the specific words that, are, that are appeared in the positive tweets. We're also going to count the ones that appeared in the negative tweets. We're also going to count the ones, rather, we're going to count everything in total. So we're going to store them in this counter. So the counter is a dictionary. So we'll have each word that appear in those sentences and their number of appearance. Um, their number of appearance. So for the first one, which is the positive here, we're going to look through each of the reviews. Then with Python, you can split each word. You know, definitely every word is separated by space in the sentence. So we're going to split by space. So when we get each word now, so we're going to get this specific word. If you look through, let's just um, say example, um, print word. So this is just going to be a word in, um, okay. Break. So you can see this is just a single word in it. So we're going to look through each of the words. Okay. So for the positive one, if the label for that particular review is positive, we're going to append, we're going to add one to the positive count with that word as its key. So for the first one, now we looked at Bro Bromwell. So it's going to append, it's going to add one to the count for this particular word. Then we also have the two counts of words, which are going to store here. Then the same thing for the negative reviews, which is here. So in this negative side, we're going to store the words that appear in the negative side here, and we're going to also add this to the total definitely because it's total. So after running that now, it's still running because we have a lot of data sets to go through, a lot of um, rules. So now the good thing about that counter function that I said is that if you just declared a normal dictionary, you won't have access to this kind of function that gives you the most common. But with counter, you can look at the most common, least common, and some other ones, probably you can check their um, documentation. So for the positive counts now, you can look at the most common positive counts. So the most common one definitely is expected is space because everyone is separated by space. But we know that this is not really relevant. We also have the, we also have full stop. And, and these are just words that are very, very occurring. So there are quite a lot here. So these are words that appear in our positive counts. Then we also have the one for our negative counts here. Space still takes over. So it appears a lot. So now you can see that 
um, we have very unnecessary things here, like space. So what then, what if we're to like check it intuitively, the thing is that there are specific words. What makes a word, what makes some words specific to positive counts and some other words to accessible negative counts? In other words, to identify those ones, the best thing we can do is to use the ratio of positive to negative counts. So if you find the ratio, we can then know that you have some words that are paid more in positive than in negative. For instance, now if you look at this space, space appears a lot in both positive and negative, so it's almost a neutral thing. So if you know if you find the ratio between these two, you almost have an, um, something close to one. But if you have something that appeared more in the positive side, you have a larger ratio. If you have something that appeared more in the negative side, you have a um, but I put it less than one, let's just say between one and zero. But that's just how it is. So we can then know the um, difference between the two of them. So things like all these um, neutral values here, they will appear in the middle. So it's more like bias, that kind of thing. So to do that now, that then leads to the next idea. So first of all, I'm going to make sure that we have um, words that appear more than 100. So that's this first condition. So we're going to go through total counts. Remember, we created the total counts dictionary here. I don't know if I printed it here. But this is it here. If you print this, you have the total counts for everything. So this is everything in total counts. So we create another um, dictionary. So this dictionary is going to be the positive to negative ratio. So first of all, I'm going to look to total counts and we're going to make sure that we have only counts that are greater than 100. So what do I mean by that? If you look at it, you have some words that are not really important that doesn't appear, um, it seems it's more. Okay, I think I should do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll just do from minus 100 to the end. Um, okay, okay. So pounds. So pounds are the most common. Hmm. I'm trying to look at the last one um, if you just look at the last one it says it's the least just puts um minus one at the end um, you know yeah okay but you know this thing is a dictionary no it's not a dictionary it's a list no this is a dictionary now you can see so that's why i can't really assess it if there's any way to find the last item on the dictionary um Try minus common minus one. Okay. No, that should not work. That will work. Fuck. <laughs> uh, does it mean I can see the last one? I want to look through it. I know most common zero is the first one. Most common two is the so minus one will just give you last everything again. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, but is there a function list common? List. Um, like the only way to do this thing is to. Um, I'm coming. Is to. Is to go through it and look at it by ourselves. So and that's very, very complicated, inefficient. So. Is it, um, let me see. For I, print I. This is very bad, but I don't know. I just have to. Okay. Um. So you can see 
this, this is the last one in the list. So um, this is the last one in the list. So you can see it appeared only once. So if you, the, the point is that most things that appeared at the bottom are words that didn't really define the meaning of the sentence. So you can see things like huge, this, some of them are even typos. That's funny. So you can see this one's called um, less, they're, they're called less in the whole thing. So if you keep going up or you'll be saying things that appeared more. So the, so the point, what I'm just trying to say is that, um, let me move this. What I'm trying to say is that this particular value here, that if the count is greater than 100, it's just a, it's just a form of assurance. You can just, you can use anything. You can use greater than 200 too. But the point is we just want to make sure that we have things that actually contribute to the sentiment. So when we have this now, if the count is greater than 100, we then do the point is negative ratio. When you do this now, if you print it now, let's see. Now, things like D, remember we saw D occurring a lot. It was very, very common. But you notice that it has values of like one. That's because it's more like a neutral, neutral thing. It occurs in both the positive side and the negative side. But things like amazing now, you know amazing almost mean um, positive sentiment. Even though sometimes it can be, um, I've forgotten this word they use in English. Is it? Um, irony. Is it irony? Oh, okay, yeah. But there's another one too, I can't remember, sure, but definitely you get what I mean. So, except if in that case, that's when um, you can then see that this person is trying to confuse the network. But later on in, when we start dealing with the actual Iranian, where feedback matters, you'll be able to say that you can use search to know, even if to know if it's an irony or not. So that one makes use of feedback. So it doesn't just depend on single words like this, but it depends on the words that came before this one. So that will be later. So things like terrible now, you know terrible should be a negative sentiment. So you can see that it's appearing between zero, while the positive ones are appearing higher up. Then the neutral ones like D will occur like one because their positive negative ratio is almost equal. Their value is actually almost equal. So that's what it means. So um so they came up with this way now. So if you notice now we have like a this 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 particular values don't really explain how it doesn't really give us how we can know um how that would be it doesn't really give us a normalized form of it. What I mean normalized if you notice, the negative ones fall between zero and let's just say tending towards one. As it keeps moving towards one, it's becoming neutral. Why from one to four are for the positive side? So if you can see that it doesn't really um, give a normalized form of it or a standardized form of it. So if you check the difference, four minus one is three. The difference between neutral and positive, and one minus zero is one. The difference between neutral and negative. So they use this form, which is log, um, log reading form. So this log then helps us to normalize both sides so that we can be sure that anything that is zero is for neutral, one is for, um, not, not just one though, but it should start from zero this time around. So anything ending towards the negative side would be negative, um, stems, negative reviews, and ones from zero upward would be positive side. So if you notice now, if you compare the different between two of them, for something like D, you have it as 0 0.05. Well, for amazing, you have one, even though it could be more than one, but you notice that it's now kind of standardized. So negative side means it's negative sweet, positive side means it's positive sweet, zero means it's neutral. So all these things now are just things that will make use of when building the neural network. So for now, we are just seeing how we can process these things and actually get important features we need. If you notice in convolutional neural networks, the convolution helped us to gain those important features. But here you can see how we can generate these features. So if you then check the positive to negative ratio, most common, you can see how it is now. So this most common just, you know, is based on the value itself. So this four, so if you notice from four, four is the maximum positive review. Then if you keep going down, these are the neutral ones, these are the neutral ones. Then from zero, we start seeing the, um, 
is 0.4. Okay, it's still more, but the best way to do it. Ah, this actually works to media at that time. Instead of doing that, which I've actually just done the reverse. I just saw it here. So if I've done the reverse of what we had initially, would have seen the least common ones. I think I should just add this to that side. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about the total, right? So the total counts. So this shows the is it print. Uh, sorry. Okay. So this is going to be this. Okay. Yeah, so this is the reverse of it. So you have less values. I'll just leave it here so you can go through it. So these are the least occurring ones. There are a lot of there are a lot of them that appear just once. So you notice that these parts are not trying needed like that. So yeah, so here we can then see from the reverse that we can then have the ones that are negative. So you can see the maximum is four. So you can see it's more or less balanced. Unlike when we had um, negative ones between zero and one, and waiting on between one and four or even more. So the next thing I'm going to do now is that we've gotten all these important things. So first to pass into the network, we actually have to transform it into text, from text to numbers, because definitely we can't pass, um, we can't pass text to our neural network into pass values. And those values are more like important with the ones that, that make up what we need to um, predict. So, okay, let's just go straight to the, yeah. So for us to create the input data, um, the input um, data, we first have to have what they call a corpus. So that corpus is going to contain every word in that particular um, in that particular review data set we have. So you can simply do that by just creating a set. So now you remember that we had total count. So that count was the count of every um, was the count of every word in the particular review data set. The refuse data set. So it contains every word, not just a single. Um, it's not the question or something. <laughs> How does one different positive word from negative word? How differentiate positive word from negative word? Now, like you are not the one that is differentiating because the data set is already labeled. Remember that. Let me just, let me, okay, let me go to the top. So I will see it. You know, when we're giving the data set, we had the labels.txt and we had reviews.txt. So, um, coming here now, we then saw that we printed the, the ones that, um, we printed the labels and the equivalent reviews. So it's not like we know the negative words and we know the positive words. The whole essence of those counts is for us to the whole essence of this count is for us to know the, num the number of times each word appeared in a negative side and number of words that appeared in a positive side. So just take it like this now. If you had this negative one now, let's just say we're using only these words that appeared here. So if you had this as a negative side, we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So none of them repeated themselves, but let's just say these are the words that appeared in the negative side. So we have a count for each of them. In this case, all of them appeared once for just this particular length, but it could be more. But the point is that for a negative, um, for a negative review, you can see terrible, things like terrible, more than once, or even more than twice. Then for a positive side, you can see um, specific words like excellent appearing more than once. But the whole point of the whole negative, that positive to negative ratio was for us to know the ones that appeared more in positive than negative. If you look at this now, even as small as this thing is, you can see things like this. This appeared in both sides. So you cannot really say these are positive or negative words because they appeared in both sides. And the whole essence of that ratio was to know, if, if you check the ratio for something like this, 
you realize that you're having things like zero based on what you normalize later. You have things like zero for this because it's almost equally the same number of times you appear in the negative side that you appear in the positive side. But things like excellence, we're almost very certain that tend to appear more in the positive side than the negative side. So we notice that for the creative side, we have a ratio higher, a higher value of a higher value since we're dividing negative from positive. So we we'll have positive values when it comes to the excellence. So imagine now we had um, a positive tweet, a positive set of tweets or reviews that had excellent about 10 times. And in the negative side, you can almost say that you won't find um, excellence there. But even if you find excellence, it's almost certain that it's an irony. So if you then find the ratio between excellence positive and excellence negative, imagine you had like two. So we have 10 divided by two, which is five. So five is very high. So it's almost certain that five is a positive hold. But if you have things that appeared more in the negative side, when you divide it by the amount of times they appeared in the positive side, because it's, it's the inverse, definitely. So it should be like one, let's just say two, it should be two over 10. That is if we're doing the reverse now. So two over 10 definitely give us something. When you normalize it, like I said, you have it in the negative value. I hope, I hope like that makes sense. I can't remember where you stop. Okay. So for us to train, for us to train now, we first need to have, um, we first need to convert every review in our data sets to values. So you can have values representing each, value, each, um, each word in the reviews. So definitely it has to be unique. We cannot be having this there. So we have to make sure that we have a corpus or a voc vocabulary that stores each word we ever see. So it stores each word we ever see in the training side. So it, it has to get one definitely. So this vocabulary will just contain a set of every word that we've, that will come across from data first. Vocab. So these are all the words. This time around, I'm not making use of counts, but it just needs to contain all words in the dictionary rather in the data set. So this is the size of the vocabulary. Definitely this is what it's meant to be based on the counts. Then now for us to pass into the network now, this is how the network is. So remember how, how it is in our normal neural network. Let me try and say so um what I going to say. So, you know, you, for your distance, for your training process now, if you have um, M set of examples, okay, I shouldn't do it like this. Let's just see, these are our training examples like this. So this is the first one, this is the first one, the second one, third one, up onto M. So these are our examples. Whenever I want to train now, there are two ways which you can train actually. The first one is by using vectors directly. So that vector will have um, a shape M by N. So where M is the number of examples and N are the features for each examples. So definitely N will be all these values here, the features. So these features are what we're going to pass into our neural network. But in this case now, we're going to, it's, it's going to still be the same thing, but this time around we're going to be looping through each of the reviews so the reviews themselves are our examples. So remember we had, um, let's just look at it. Um, I think the best way to look at it is N of reviews. So this shows that we have 25,000 reviews. So it's more like our M is 25,000. So I'm going to look through each of our M and then we'll have N, N are the features. So those features are what we're going to then pass into our network. So we're going to show how we can generate those features. So these are the features here. So those features are each of the words. So for the first step now, we already have our number of reviews. We're going to look through each review in the reviews data set. Then the features are now going to be the values that appeared in that particular um, review. 
So, okay, look at it. We already have this vocab. This thing can be confusing, but I just hope that we understand it. So we have the vocab now. So this vocab contains everything. This vocab contains all the words you can ever see or you can ever come across in that data set. So we have it over again. So the length of vocab is 74,000 and 74. So, okay, we've stored that in our head. Then now, our input layer, if you look at it, this is our input layer to our network. I'm sure we still remember how neural networks work. So these are our inputs here. So we now want to make the length of this our input to be the size of the vocab. So if we were to do it in the normal neural network right now, let's just say we had one single input. So it would be our, I'm not going to draw a line, but I hope we get it. So this is going to be our first side, which is our features for the first example. I'm going to multiply it by the width. So definitely, you know that we always have to make it like this. So if you have a weight that outputs two things, let's just say this one and this one here. So this would be the weight, and this would be another weight. So we always have to make sure that the length of this, um, you know, the number of columns here has to be the same as the number of rows here. I hope you still remember that. But basically, that's what we're going to do. So now we can see that we want our input layer, which is this. This is our input here. Layer one, ah, this will be hard to write. Layer, we call this layer zero. Okay, this is going to be our layer zero now. So now the whole point of this now is that we we created a zeros and um, that was used to zero script, an array of zeros with one row and the vocab size column. So I'll explain how this works now. So remember that we had this vocab. So this vocab contains all a list of, it contains all the words you can ever come across in the data set. So once you have this now vocab, we now want to create our input. So our input is going to be this size of vocab because we're going to fill it with values. So once you have this vocab size, you can see what it should be. Let me just print this layer, let's call zero. So we have this, the, the shape is um, like the written here already, one by seven four. 1,074. Okay, you already did it here. So now this is shape. So what we're going to do now is that we already have the shape of it. So the whole point of this now is that what we want to do is that since it contains um, 7,074 7, columns, what we want to do is that for every word that appear in that particular review. You know, like we said, we're going to be looking through each of the layers. So this is just the first example here. So this first example, you can look at it as the first review we're going to go through. So, you know, if we had more here, like if you had drawn more, it means that we're looking at all the examples. But it's we're going to be taking it example by example, so which is reviews by reviews. For the first review now, we had zero to 7,074. So we're going to get all the words that appeared in that particular review. So those words we get in that particular review, we're going to store them in their respective indexes. So you know the reason why we created the reason why we created that vocab um, the reason why we created that vocab set was because we want to store each of the words that can ever appear in that data set there. So those words have um, indexes. So we know that whenever we're going through this um, layer zero, so each, each part of this layer zero represents the index of each word in those vocabulary. So if, if I just do a simple example, let me just do something like this here. If we had, if we had our vocab as, let's just say something that contains it, comma, is, Comma, uh, no, comma, where? So if this is our vocab, let me make it a set instead, since everything is unique. So if we if we see that this is what about this this is the number of words, I'm just giving an example that we ever come across. Then if I then look through it now, so um, 
our layer one, let's just say layer underscore one, or layer underscore zero is now equals to this size. So let's just say np dot array or np dot zeros. Um, one comma lines of carb. carb. Mm, okay. Ninety dot zeros invalid syntax. Oh, did I make a mistake here? Oh, okay. So now we've created a layer zero. So this layer zero just contains each of the each of the indexes, each of the indexes. So we can see that this is it, if, are, uh, and where. What I'm going to do is I'm going to map it to each of their indexes. So at index zero, we know that this space is allocated for it. This space is allocated for is. This space is allocated for r. This space is allocated for where. When we see this like this, so this is what we're going to pass as our input. So if we then have our review now, so our review is just like a person's sentence. Let's, let me do it in a new line here. But I'm going to still show it in the main example. This one is just like an explanation of how it's going to work. So if you have this as a layer zero, when we pass our first which is the first review. I just say the first review is a string that the person said. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can. Okay. Do you kind of went off a well? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. So do we do we get up to this point? Please? Because this thing can be confusing. Also, you know if you are following at least up to this point. Uh, kind of yes. <laughs> okay, okay. What I thought is that if what what we're trying to do now is that we want to know how to know the important values you are passing it into our network because definitely you have to convert it to um to values instead of just text itself then if this is our vocab now okay like i've said so this is going to be our input to our neural network so we want to now know the ones that are important or that are contributing to that particular sentence so if you have a review now let's just do this review is don't mind it's just going to be very silly let's just say um is it is a uh, so if you have this as a review now, I will pass into it. So what it's going to do now is that it's going to like use the Python function split split by space. So it will go to each of them. So look at is. So it will first check is the index of is in this vocab. So index of is is at index one. So layer zero will then have one at this index here. So it will add the one to this index. Then to look for it, it is at index zero. So to add one to that index zero, yeah. So this will become one one zero zero. Then it will see is again. So when it says is, it is at index um one. So this one becomes two. If you guess because we already saw it before, so it will come two. Then the last one is r. So it look for r in that vocab. The index is at index two. So we'll add one to that index two in our layer. So now what we just done now is that we've converted from the text to features this time around. So our our neural network is now going to have features one, two, one, zero. So it means that these words are, are they have more width. That's what he's just trying to say. So things like um it is and are but if you notice now this is just a like very very simple example you don't really have anything to do with the final prediction, but the point is that you know it's going to have a label. The output of this particular um, 
this particular review is going to have a label. So it's either positive or negative. So the thing is that whenever it sees those kind of things, just be like the weight. Then it will then compare it with the actual output, which is the class to which it belongs, either positive or negative. Then to make it start knowing how important things like it is are. But in this case, it's going to be respect to the main data set. So I'm just going to switch from this now to the main thing we're going to go through. So where we stopped was that we created our layer. Our layer zero would be NP.0. We decide our vocab. So remember that this size of our vocab, which is some 4,000 and some 4. Oh, I'm not confused myself. Yeah. Then we created our layer zero, which is our first, this is going to be our um, first input layer, which is this. Then we're going to just use a single leading layer, then our output layer. So our output layer is either positive or negative. So if this is what you have now, then this is the shape. The shape is definitely going to be the shape of our vocabulary. So what we're going to do now is that for each review, we're going to be putting the words that occurred in that particular review in their particular index. Then this is what we're going to use to know those index is using this particular dictionary. So they call it words to index. So it just makes us know the index. Remember what we already showed? We want to map each word to their index. So what we're going to go through is the vocab. Remember that vocab is a list, it's rather is a set. So do that set just contains each of the values in that full data set or corpus. So we have the index for index and the word in and then raise vocab. So this words to index is a dictionary that is going to store the value, which is the word, rather the word, and the index where it gets stored. So this means that um, this is the word and this index. If you know how to create dictionaries, it shouldn't really be an issue. So now when you run this, you then see that we've mapped every word to their particular index. If you remember what I was trying to explain, that we use the index to know the position in that particular full array. So we know that the position of space, whenever we see space, space occurred at index zero. Laid, laid as of them occurred at index one. So if you come across, when we start moving through our reviews, that each of the review, which, of, which are the review example, we'll be storing each word in our layer, we'll be adding to their width. That's what we're going to do. We'll be adding to their width based on this index. So if we see Joanita again in our review, we'll know that it is that um, Joanita value is that it's, it's meant to be stored at index 13. Same thing check, it's meant to be stored at index 14. So that's just how these are what to back. So what we're going to do now is that this function is updating this layer. This makes sure that it's going to clear every value in the input layer for each example. You know, we're going to be iterating through each of the examples. So whenever we finish with the first example, we cannot use those weights in the next example, which is more like that PyTorch thing. If you notice, um, that our um, clear gradient function, so that we don't use the gradients of the previous training example in the next training example. So it's more like the same thing. We're going to clear the inputs because those are the weights for that particular um, review. And now we have a new review I'm going to go through. So that's our assessment to zero. Then now we're going to count how many times each of the word appeared. So um, if I can remember this thing, I'll start the results in the year one. Yeah, so this is exactly what I was talking about here. Remember I, what, what I showed you was that we're going to go through each of the review. If you look at this, this particular function takes in a review. When it takes in the review, it's going to go through each value in the review. When it, gets, when it goes through each of the value in the review, it will then store the count in their specific index. So remember that layer zero now, if you say layer zero, if, if, you, if you print out this now, this just means that we're looking at the first row. That's the essence of this thing. When you say layer zero, square bracket zero. It looks like it means we're looking at the first index. And definitely is only one, um, what do you call it, which is the rule. is only one index, which is the rule. So what we make for that word then tells us the index. If you remember, the essence of this word to make is also the index where that word is stored in our main vocabulary. So this, this, this particular thing here, if I can see, um, so let me copy this. If 
print this and then let me run it. Copy this is zero. So now you know you know what this means. This review zero just means the first review in our um in our reviews full data set. So we're going to pass that first review. What is going to happen is that it's going to go through each word in that first review. I think I should print the word. So print word. Then we have broom well. This broom well. So that's the first word here. So it then checks the index. If you look at it, it's going to check the index. It's, it's currently stored at index 71,730. That's the index where it's stored in our main full data set, which is that vocab. Then once you know that's the index, it means that layer one now, which is our input, has a one weight. We've increased the weight by one in that particular index. So when when we create this function now, so let me go back and do this. We then have this here for that first review, which is this. We're going to realize that some words that are code that are code multiple times in just that particular review will have their width. It means that the value that is stored at index 18. Let me let me show and it. Um, I think it should be for card index 18. Okay, set it not. Uh, then let it is well. Okay, let's get another one here. For I and for card. If I because it's G then am I sure this what I mean? Oh no 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 sorry, what am I doing? I think this is the first index here. So it's just going to be the first index actually now. For carb. So it means this is space, definitely. So the first index of our array, which is this, this is our first index. The occurrence of the word is 18. So that's what he's trying to say. If I can look through, let me look through this um, for in. Let me see. I am going to look through everything. I don't know why they're just showing me this. Well, okay, anyways, but what this is just trying to say is that um, the first value, what this is trying to tell us now is that the first index of our inputs, or rather of our layer zero array, occurred 18 times. And from our vocabulary, we can see that that first index is space. So space occurred 18 times. And other ones too. So you can see that this particular one occurred zero times, zero times, zero. And because it's very large, you can't see other ones, but there are some other ones that had weight too. That's it. So at this point, I want us to like first go through what we've said, what we've discussed so far. Does anyone have any issue at all? Or any confusing part? Can we hear me? I don't, yeah, I can hear you. I don't think there's any issue so far. Okay, now just at least, like, let, let me hear from three different people, please. Let me show that everybody's on the same page. Okay. That's one. Yeah, it's clear so far. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
okay so um for me i've i've been following i won't really say i understand everything yeah but like i don't have any questions for now so hopefully maybe at the end when i get to review okay okay but one more thing like do you, do you get the reason why we're doing everything we've done so far yeah sure yeah okay okay I think that's the most important thing is because what we're trying to do is that unlike unlike convolutional layer networks, all those max pulling convolutional layers, like they made they just helped us gain those features without us really knowing what was going inside. But we just know that we had our um our filter that was going through each of the images and generating features, that kind of thing. But here, like what the ones that are generating our features here. So there are many ways to which you can do this thing. This is just like an approach. The whole point is that we want to make sure that we're feeding things actually contributes to the sentiment to our data sets. So that's why it looks manual. Like, honestly, this part is actually very interesting. It's just that, hey, okay, I've already done my thing. But this part is more like data preprocessing. Whenever you're dealing with any, any of related projects, the point is that you want to make sure that you encode your, your, your text to, um, to values. They call it what to check. And there are some other methods to I can't remember all of them, but basically we just want to make sure that we have the right um, text presentation that passed into our network for us to get um, good results. So the next thing now is that we have this function. So it's just a simple function that is going to convert our label from positive to negative to one or zero, which is our um, our y, what we want to predict. So it does not really have, it's not, it's not doing much then if you pass um if you, it is the label of the first index is quite easy if you pass it, you have one there's not really much about this side here now we're going to build the neural network we're going to use what we've done so far to then build an actual neural network to do this thing so the first thing is the initialization here we are going to use that particular structure our input node our hidden input node is 10. so if i was to draw this thing here i don't know the size of our our input, but it could be any value. Let's just I'm just using this straight line to represent our input. Then our hidden node, like we've seen here, is 10. So we have one, two, three, up to the tenth one. Then from here we then have our final one, which is the sentiment. So this is either positive or negative. Slash negative. Okay, so this is going to be our sentence. We're going to do our normal um, contribution. So this guy's going to contribute to it, contribute to it, contribute to it, and contribute to it. So that is what we're going to do. It's still a normal neural network procedure, but this time around, our input is going to be the presentation of each of those texts. So now once we've gotten to that part, once we've, read, once, we've, once we've presented the text as values, we've done the main thing. The next thing that's happening is just normal neural network. Then here, first of all, when we have our, when we pass in our reviews, our reviews is the full data set we want to train. The labels for those reviews, the number of hidden nodes and our learning rates. So here are the full learning rate is 0 0.1. Then what we'll do is that we're going to preprocess our labels and rather not our labels, our reviews. So this preprocess is what we've already discussed earlier, but it's around to integrate into our real network. So this process now, what it takes is the reviews and the label. Now the first thing we're going to do is to have our full vocabulary that's is this our vocabulary, which is what we discussed initially. So this vocabulary is going to contain every word in that particular reviews data set. So I'm going to have each of the words that will ever occur from our data set. We'll go through each of the review, get the words and add it to our set. So you know the essence of this set now is to make sure that if you come across any word more than once, it gets ignored. So it's just going to be unique words that get, that, that get stored here. So now once we've done this now, you can then convert our vocabulary set into a list. Now this part is important. If you notice what happened when I tried to Get the index of a particular set. It will tell you that you can't do that for a set. It's only for list. Lists work with indexes. So we have to map it to a list so that we can have index represent, represent each of those words. 
The point is that definitely lists can contain more than one um, value, but no more than one index do. But since already you've thought the set initially, we are very certain that this list contains unique values too. So now we have a list of every word that can occur. Now, our label vocabulary is quite simple, and I don't know, it's not really necessary, honestly. The point you can just put positive and negative, which is an array with length too. Because definitely, it's going to get the set of every label, and the label can either be zero, um, positive or negative. So it's just going to be a set of two values. Then convert it to a list, it's positive and negative. Then now, this is going to be the length of our vocabulary size and the length of our label too. So this should be equal. You can use this Python asserting function to just make sure that they are equal. Then now, what to index? We've already discussed this one. This one just makes us, or rather, it helps us map every word we find out in our reviews to their particular index in the reviews vocabulary. So reviews of our vocabulary, like we already said, contains every word. So now this is just us creating it. We'll go through every word in our reviews vocabulary and get their index. So we'll store their index as the value and the word itself as the key. So whenever we come across this word, when we're going through each review, we can just load their index. So that's, that's us for that one. Then now, label to index two. It's still, this one is very, very simple still, but it's just mapping like positive to zero or negative to one. But in this case, I think it's come across negative first, but you can just say negative is zero, positive is one, but it's just for dynamic six. So you have a sentiment analysis that contains more than just positive and negative. Let's just say good, bad, better, best, or those, those sort of things when they're more than just two. You want this to automatically identify it. So that's the essence of us doing this. But in this case, it's going to go through each of them. And um, sets arrange things in alphabetical order. So negative is going to come definitely before positive. So negative will be indexed zero, positive will be indexed one in this legal to index map. We've done that now. That's going to be the initialization. So if you can check it, the um, preprocessing the data is part of what you are going to do in the initial stage. So now this init network now is now going to just assign each of those things already declared. So our input node is going to be the length of our, our vocabulary. Like you, do we know why? I think we should like first know why we're saying this. We're going to make sure that our input node to the network is going to be the size of vocabulary. Does that make sense? Like I want us to like say something. Do you agree with that? Are we here? Yeah, 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 I agree. If they are not the same, there will be conflict. Like the input node has to be the same as the as the size. Are we? Are we? Oh, yeah. So that it's be able to feed into the neural network. They have to be the same number. Mhm. Mm yeah. Sorry, right. there's a mask covering my face. So yeah. Oh, right. okay. I see. So, uh, but, but what the main thing to just add is that remember what we said that we want to. I don't know if I drew it here, but this is our input node. Let's just say this length of our input node. The point is that we are going to set it to the size of our vocabulary because our vocabulary is going to contain all the index of every word that can come in. So like I've explained before, the input node is going to be exactly the same size as the vocabulary because that vocabulary contains every word that can never appear. Then what we then did now is this update input layer. I'll still come to it. It's supposed to then add the values that occurred in that particular review. So it's just going to keep adding to the, okay, I think we'll come across it, but let's just say this, the, we're going to just let's say this initial network size is that it's going to pass the input node, store it in of input node, hidden nodes, output node, and learning rates. But this is just going to be our normal for propagation. So we have our learning rates. So if you look at this now, this is going to be our width. If you remember how we did it, how we, how we learned how this weight thing works, is that we're going to have an array with the input node as the, um, the, the size of the, the length of our input node as the number of rows for our width. Remember how we did it now? So if we have this, I know we spent a lot of time explaining this particular one before, 
But if you had our input node as this length here, if this is our input node with length this, in order for us to multiply it by anything, which is going to be our width, it's going to be dot product of our width. So our width is going to have this same length where this length is equivalent to this length here. Then the number of columns will now be our next output, which is going to be the output of this particular first layer. Um, the, the output of this first layer, that's what we're going to see here. So it's going to, if it's four, if the output is four, we're going to have four here. But basically, that's just the explanation here. If our width one, we're going to have our input node length and our hidden node length as the number of columns, which is going to be the next layer here, the length of the next layer, which we're going to have here. So if the next layer is going to have four, then we will make sure that we have four as number of columns. So we'll have such. So that's all the clear now with zero one. Then our with zero two is going to be the length of this one here, the length of our initial one, which was the hidden one. So the, you know you know that this is going to be the number of columns for the next one. If you do this to the output would be another one here. Remember that the output would be the number of rows in this first one and the number of columns in the second one. So we have this where we have one, two, three, and four. This is too much, but let's just say like this. We'll have four because this is exactly going to be output when we do the dot product of these two. So you have this. So it means that our next input node would be this, and the weight for this input node would be this multiplied by the weight to be, sorry if this is confusing, but let's just say, this is the brackets here. So this would be one, no, no, let me not do it that way. But you know that it will be like one, two, three, and four. So I to work here with this guy. Then the, out, the size of our output node is one in this case. So definitely this would be our output node one. That's why it's like this here. So this is going to be our hidden node, the last hidden node that we saw, and the output node next. Then this part here, if you're wondering what this part is, but this is like another topic on its own, but it's basically just weight initialization. Based on like people that have written papers and research, they discover that it's best to initialize your weight by, by multiplying it by the negative of 0 0.5. The square of, the square of your output node, what can I say? You know, this is, um, how can I write this thing mathematically? But well, this is just this raised to the power minus 0 0.5. Like this. So when you put, when you put it like this, this is more like, a, this is like an ideal way to initialize your weight. You have to get good results here. But you could do it the normal way too. You could actually just randomly initialize it as the normal way you could have done initialization, which is something like this. Oh no. Um, you could do it like this too. It will give you random weight, but based on research, we saw that it's best to initialize your weight like this. It will give you better results. I need to it will be faster to converge. So we've declared our width for each of our networks. So this is just weight structure, which is similar to what we already know. Then finally, our output will just be. Um, this is going to be our no no no. Remember what we said. I wanted to make sure that our input layer has the same size as what we're passing into our input. So this is going to be our layer here, which is this. Yeah, this is our input layer. So I'm just going to set it as this, the length of this, that's our layer zero, from what you can see here. Now we have set our layer zero, to be the input nodes here. Now, what we're going to do now is that we already like spoke about this one. This way we then set the occurrence of each word in the review to their specific um, index location. Now, if you have if you if you have a single review, now let's just say pass in the review. First of all, we have to clear it to prefer to um, remove all the previous um, weights that had accumulated. Now we now say for word in the reviews to so go through each word now. Now this is just like a check to check if the word is in that particular full corpus. 
because you know you know in real scenarios now even though we have the full set even though we have our full um set our full training sets and we create a a vocabulary that contains every word in our training set there are very high possibilities that when we then start using it for testing purposes so let's just say you created a twitter segment analysis there's this popular um, twitter data set it's publicly available where you can just see a lot of tweets by people and their sentiment so they already labeled it different tweets and their sentiment whenever you train definitely you have to have your full corpus which is your full vocabulary that stores every word you can ever come across when you then start making practical use of it let's just stay on twitter if you are doing it live on twitter there are very high possibilities that you see new words that doesn't exist in your full vocabulary but in this case we don't need them that's the whole point so now that's why we're using this check so if that word is in our vocabulary that's then we'll make use of it but if it's not in our vocabulary to ignore it so and the point is that like there's very high probability that it won't really affect our performance because it's just like one word or very few words. But that's why it's just good to have this very large data set that contains most possible words that we ever come across. Then now, what we're going to do is that remember that these are self-declare. Self-declare is our input, which is here. And we've already set it to be the length of our input node. So this input node is more like the length of our vocabulary. We we'll set it to zero. So what we're going to do is that for every word that appears in this particular review, we're going to be increasing it by word. We're going to increase that word its occurrence by one. So layer, so this um, cell dot layer zero contains zeros initially. So we're going to be changing every word that occur in this review. We'll be changing the index. We'll be increasing the index by one. Cell dot words to index contains the mapping between the word and the particular index. So if you pass in a single word now into this place, it returns the index in that vocabulary where it's meant to be stored. So remember it was initially zero, so we'll add one to it. Then we'll keep adding one and keep adding one. So we'll have values. The words that are called very often will have a, a larger number of appearance in our system, in our layer zero. So that's what we're going to then pass as our input once we've gotten that. Then this is our guest target label. This is our guest target for label. This is just going to return one if it's positive and zero if it's negative. Then the normal thing that we know we do need sigmoid for our activation function here then this sigmoid outputs the derivative is the derivative of its sigmoid function so this part is important so we're going to back up again now for the training side now we're going to just ascertain um assert that our training view is the same as as our training label that the size is the same then correct so far this is just going to keep track of the accuracy now we'll go through each of our training reviews now so we're going to look through our training reviews data sets then we're going to pick the first review which is the first index of our training reviews data set we're going to pick the first one we we'll pick the first review and we'll pick its label now for the fourth pass now we're going to update layer input so what this is going to do now is that this is going to create our layer zero if you if you check this particular cell dot update input layer let me go to it, so I will see it. Updating bit layer, this is going to create that first self dot layer zero, which is our input node. This is going to be our input node. And this input node contains the words in that particular review that are important. So the ones that do not appear do definitely contain zeros, while the ones that appear do have ones to it. Now, when we, when we do that here, which is the update input layer, we have our input node containing values. It's a global variable, so we don't actually need to declare it like this hidden layer. So our next hidden layer now is now going to be the dot product of it and the width. I don't know if we should agree with this because this is how we get our next hidden layer. It's just going to be the dot product of our um, of our first layer, which is our input layer, and the width, our first width. So this will give us our hidden layer. Then note in this case we didn't use an activation function. There's a reason for that, so they won't use, make use of our activation function because it doesn't really do much. It's only at the final output we're going to use the activation function. So at this point, the reason why it's in this activation function is not for non linearizing but basically for the forgetting the probabilities that we've discussed already. So it's then make our output range between zero and one. Once close to one, our 
um, positive tweet, one close to zero and a negative tweet. So that's the essence of this particular zigmoid function. But for the hidden layers, we do not need zigmoid. Now we've gotten this now. Um, just to ask, do we, do we remember this thing like backpropagation? So Sadiq mentioned that he already went through backpropagation. Do we still remember how it works? Yes, we do. I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, so now what we're going to do with our backpropagation error is then get the error. Now, the error function is not actually as simple as just layer 2 minus. Um, you know, the output of layer 2 is our sigmoid function, which is the prediction, which is our, um, our model prediction. But, you know, we have to get an error function. And if, we, if we still remember it, we know that from that error function, we'll find the derivative. And from the derivative, we we'll then know we'll have a simplified version of that error function with respect to the weight. Then, based on that, I think we should just sit here because I know I wrote it somewhere. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is it here. When we are done with the whole differentiation, we'll have something as simple as this. And this just means the um, actual prediction minus our target multiplied by the derivative of the last sigmoid function. That was the sense of that particular sigmoid here, this one here, this sigmoid output to derivative. So this just gets the derivative of the sigmoid function. Sorry, I'm coming. Uh, um, sorry, I'll be, uh, There's what they call the error term. So that error term is just the multiplication of our error, which is layer two minus the actual label itself, multiplied by that derivative, which is what you can see here. So this is here, multiplied by the derivative of the last one, which is that sigmoid function. So that's how we then get our error function for no not error function, they call it error term. So that error term is what we use to do back propagation in that first output layer. That's for layer two here. We're going to use this one to update it. This is going to be our error term for that first one. Then now, based on how neural networks work, for each layer, if you, let, let me try and look at this diagram. Let us look at this diagram. If you have something like this now, if you have this as your output and you check the error, the error of the, is forced to update the weight now. You know the weights are these things here. The weights are what you multiply by it when I get this final one. So then know the input that contributed more to weight, or rather the weights that contributed more to the error. If you have an error term, we then split that error term by everything here. So based on their weights, we split them. So this can simply be done by just multiplying the error by those weights. Sorry, let me say something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome. Um, um, where was I? Yeah. So this gives us the error derivative for that first output layer two. Then now, the for the back propagation, like I've said, for the next um, layer, which is layer one, now for us get layer one error we split it based on the error derivative of that layer two. So we can just split it to the weight by just multiplying, by finding the dust product of our layer two derivative and the weight of our layer one. So this then gives us the error for that particular layer. Then from here, we can then get our layer delta. Normally we would have just multiplied this by this same sigmoid here. But if you check, we didn't make use of the we didn't use sigmoid function at the output of that layer one, so we don't need to do it. We only use sigmoid here. That's why we needed to multiply it by this when we're finding derivative. But here we don't need it since we're not finding derivative. You know what, what I'll try and do is that I'll try and send like the mathematical proof for all these things. But these are just like the final um, simplified form of those differentiation. 
So that's why it's looking as simple as this. But initially, it was you be finding there is respect to the weight you are working with. Then now, um, yeah, we rated our derivatives for that layer one. The weights of layer one are just this. Then to then perform our weight updates based on the whole um, gradient descent procedure, the with the weight of the first one, the first layer, the weight of the first layer. Oh, I didn't let me the weight of the first layer would be the error function, rather the error term of the error term of that particular layer multiplied that's like rather not multiplication you must you find the dot product of these um, features which is x you can just look at this one as x let me try and show you here but this is our weight object here it is our linear rate this is our linear rate here multiplied by our error term this is our error term multiplied by the input this this is so because when we when we differentiate our error function respects to the width. We have the error term multiplied by x. This linear rate, you know, linear rate is just added later on, but we have our error term multiplied by x. When you differentiate it, that's what you get as your output. So you can either just know that that's what you need to do, or you can actually prove it by yourself. I'll try and send it to you so I can see how we go to this final point. So the x is the um, input to each of those layers. So this is the input to layer one. We we'll find the transfer side the multiplication works, the dot product works here. Then we'll serve our linear rates. Then for the first one to the same procedure, it will be the cell of layer one, which is our input for the layer one, transpose, then dot products, our layer one error term. So this will just be our gradient descent procedure. And at the end, you can then check this side, we then like check that if the layer is greater than or equals to 0 0.5 is a positive one. If it's less than 0 0.5 is a negative one. So this is just you choosing your own um, form of metrics. You can actually make it harder, like 0 0.8 is positive, 0 point, anything less than 0 0.8 is negative, anything greater than 0 0.8 is positive. But that's just the essence of this condition here. Then here's just like check timing. Then for the test, you know basically it's test, what you just need to do is just to, um, just do forward pass only. So that's just the forward pass here. We just do a normal width multiplication, pass it through our layers, and then the output, we just output this. That is what test. So if we try and train this thing now, here, the first train is going to be using, um, what is not for you? Okay. Okay. So here we're going to use the limit of 0 0.1. Then we'll check the accuracy. Well, basically, because of time, if you run this one now, we'll notice that the accuracy didn't really increase. But that's because you use a very high linear rate, so it was almost not learning anything. Then as we kept on reducing the linear rates, we'll be seeing that, yeah, at the point where, if we, when we use 0 0.01, when I run it, it didn't really give much, like a very good accuracy. When I use 0 0.001, the accuracy actually stepped up from 50 to 61.1%. So like, I want to get you back on this side so far. So how, how has it been before we go to the next stage of this pre-processing? If there's any confusion, please let me know. Okay, um, although you did well, but the way I've been learning so far is when I go back and we watch the video again. So I'm feeling mm -hmm. that when I, I said the way I've been learning so far is when I go back and we watch the video and we listen again. So for now, I was able to go through it and I guess I should be fine for now. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. And you have to. Um, well, it's for now personally it's a, it's a bit confusing for me but um 
I think I'll need to go back and review it maybe at the end of the class and uh, okay okay well, which part exactly what part exactly is confusing um when you were building the network oh that's the top part yes yeah okay okay let me let me first go back to it okay here can be is it the back propagation side or yeah before if, before even the back propagation you lost me there okay this is the first this is the training part so what part of the training part? I think from when you started building the network itself, um, the nodes and everything. Oh, the nodes. Yes. But do we, do we, when, did you try doing most of these, like, evolution and network assignments? Yes, yes, yes. That, you know, that, um, even though PyTorch helped us a lot, so what we just needed to do was just pass our input and pass our next seeding input. Do you remember how, how we're doing it? For each linear part, we pass in our input, then yes. pass what we expect our output. Yes, I, I understand. Yeah, that, that worked because, you know, the weight, what, look, okay, the dimension of the weight is, the number of rows in the weight is the number of columns in the input, and then the number of columns in the weight is the number of rows in the output. Do you get that? Okay, yeah, yeah, I get that part. Yeah, let me look at it again. The number of rows, the number of columns in the input should be the same as the number of rows in our width. And the number of columns in our width should be the number of rows. Let's say rows, rather the number of columns in our output. Do we get? Yes. Yeah, so that's why when we are initializing our width with zeros and this, we, we, what we did was that for our weight now, our first weight is going to have as rows the input nodes. So that input node is basically the number of columns in our input. Then the number of columns will now be the size of our heading node. So we noticed that for our next weight now, we see that um, the number of rows will now be that same heading node and the output will then be the output nodes. This just makes the mathematics work for us so that when we then start doing building our network now, for our first layer, the, the our first layer, you know, we first had the input layer. The input layer, we already built it. The input layer is just the length of our vocabulary. Now, once we pass our input layer, in order for us to get this layer one, we multiply our layer zero, which is the input layer, by that with zero. So this math will work because the number of um, the number of columns in this layer one is the same as the number of rows in this width, and the number of width the number of um, columns in this width is what now leads to the number of um, columns here too. So, you know, definitely when you when you do dot um, dot multiplication, that's dot product rather. The output is going to be the number of rows here and the number of columns here. So if the number of rows here is one, because if you check now, if you check where we created this layer zero, let me go up. You see that it was one by, um, let me look for why I did it. Yeah, look at this layer zero is one by 700 and, and 74,074. That means it's just a single row. And 74,074,000 rows. 74,074 rows, yeah. So when you find a dust product of something that has row one, it means that this layer one has row one too. And with zero one has so and and with zero uh, one has wait, do you have something to say? Yeah, in that layout zero, was it not um one um one row and seventy four thousand columns, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. Yes. I, I thought yeah, I heard so that was, you say row. Oh, no, 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 no. Even if I said to them, it's a mistake, but it is columns. So when you multiply this and this, we will have the year one as one by the number of columns in this width. One is gotten from this guy, and the size of this width is gotten from... Let's look at it. I think we wrote something like that. Our hidden node when we're training. We passed it. Was it 10 or something? 
was if you notice his pass is getting guess now he didn't know the ball. I'm trying to remember for pass the ball. It should be later on. He didn't know the yeah, so this is here, the hidden of this pen. So that's what we're going to have as the output of our first hidden layer. That's that's the output of our um that's going to be the length of our hidden layers. Where where was I again? Okay, of course it. So that's what's going to happen here. The hidden layer um output to be this here. So this would be one by ten because this width is going to have ten columns. So that's how we get our layer two. Then from our layer two, we go straight to our output. So this one now, the width is going to be five by one. If you check, it's going to be five by one. Why this one is one by five? So when we have one by five multiplied by five by one, we have a one by one. Where that one is just our prediction. So that's our forward pass. Then the backward pass now, I think all we should just know for now is that our arrow is our predicted output by mod m minus the actual output. Even though, like I've said, it's not as straightforward as that. In fact, if I could show you my, my book, you see how we finally got at that simple um, simple operation. But it, it wasn't actually simple as that. It wasn't as simple as that. Then now the delta is not like our error term. So our error term is this error multiplied by the derivative of that sigmoid function with respect to that layer. So once we've got our error term now, this our error term is more like the error derivative. So now we can then split the error. You know, you know, bow back propagation is we are reversing it, we are going backward now. So it's just like if you if you if you lost your key, let's just say you are going to the market, and let me just say you lost your key, and you lost, you found out that you lost your money when you go to the market. And I, ideally, what you do is that you retrace your steps, like you start going back and start saying, okay, did I go to this particular place first? Or did I go to this place? Then you check all the places you went to. So it's more like you're going backward in the same way you came. So that's how it is here. So this your error term now. It's going to be like your total error at that point. Then now, when you start back propagating now, you'll be going back to each of the layers Let's just say if you have an error term at this point, if you have an error function here, what that means is that each of these widths at this point here contributed to that error. But the size of those widths determine which part contributed more. So we then split that error to each of those nodes that through the width based on the width value. So imagine like a simple way to do it now is that if you had like three m. Um, Four values here, one, two, three, four. And this one had more. What you do is that the, the, the way you share it now is based on everyone's contribution over the total contribution. So if this one was um, if this one was two, this one was one, this one was one, and this one was one. So that's one plus one plus one, that's five. So in total it's five. It means that where you are splitting your error to this first node here, it will be two over five times the error. It means that it contributed to to fifth of that error. Then this one is one over five of the error, this one is one over five of the error, this one is one over five of the error. So that's how you split it. So that's like you going back. So an easy way to do it is to see get the same thing is by multiplying that error by the weight here. So you know, you know, if you look at what I did now, it's, just, it's more like I'm explaining the whole thing again, which is back propagation. If you notice what I did was that I divided this one by the total point, the total um the total um weight values for that particular node. So if this one was two, it would be two over five because I said this one was two, this one was one, this one was one, and this one was one. So it'd be two over five. But what they discovered was that you don't actually need to do two over five. Like if you do two, if you just call it two, like it already means that contribution. If you call this one one, it already means that contribution. If you call it one, you already so you can actually just eliminate the denominator and just make use of the numerator. When you do back propagation, you still get the same thing. It's more like a contribution to the loss. So you don't actually need to make it that accurate. It should still work irrespective. 
So the point is that once you have that thing, so you have two, one, one, and one, you're not forced to split that error in each of these parts. You can just find the dot product of those weights and the error. So which is what we did here. You should check it. Yeah, so back propagation, we just multiplied our error term by the width of that particular layer. When you multiply it by the little layer, it means that you split the error to each of those widths. So each of those widths now have their own error. That's, so those layers have their own error. So from there, we now have the error for that one. Then if you had more layers, so you, you start splitting it more and more, that kind of thing. So in this case now, like the error delta for the next layer, since that was actually the last layer we needed before our input layer. So this is where we stopped. So it's just simply the error without trying to multiply by our sigmoid. Like I've said, that's because we didn't make use of that sigmoid function here. So that's just it. Then, oh, sorry, did I, did I explain what you wanted to ask or the part that was confusing to you? Uh, yeah, yes, you did. It's clear. Okay. But what I want us to just try and get now is not really the way the neural network works. Mm. Even though it's very, very important for us to know the way the neural network works. I don't know if somebody told us about this book, Make Your Own Neural Network. Are, are we head no. of such? No, I haven't. Oh, I think I'll send it. I think I'll send it to the group. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Sadiq mentioned it. Uh... Yeah, like that book is like it's very, very um, explanatory. So this is the book. Maybe I'll share it again. I'll share it to the group so we'll see. It. So like, you really explain how the whole neural network thing work. Then it will. It, this one will make us understand that neural network aspect. So look at look at it now. So they explained each of the process here from the beginning of the node. Think we, like we are, I, I'm sure we should understand the fault propagation very well. But, so I won't really like, go to the fault propagation aspect. It's just the back side. Mm. Right, I think we should try and read this book. It's not actually long. It's something that will take your time. It's only around 24 pages. And it's most, they have, very, they have a lot of visual representation. So it's not like the, everything was text and it should be long to read. They use text and they use diagrams to explain everything that is working. If you can see it here, we're explaining each of the layers. So I also want to go to one part. Um, so, um, yeah, I mentioned I'll share the book too as part of this um, this class material. I'll share it. Now, um, okay, this is what I was trying to say here. Now, if you have our output here, let's just say we have our output after fault propagation here. We have this. So what we then do now is to then get our error function. If you remember from the beginning of the class, where I said that we then have to use an error function that is continuous. And I guess some other properties that we need to know to make sure that it is differentiable. So it has to be continuous, it has to be differentiable. First, then um, do gradient descent. So those are like some characteristics of gradient descent. Now, what next? After doing our fault propagation, how does our network then learn? So if you have like 0 0.76, 6, um, 0 0.726, how do you back propagate? So our error now for back propagation now, the, how the error would then be split between everything that contributed to it. So like they've said here, if the weight for this particular layer was 3.0 and the weight for this one was 1.0, then it means that this particular layer contributed three over four of that error. So it would be three over four multiplied by that error. This one will be one over four multiplied by that error. So yeah, they said that you can't just split it as half half. So it would be three over four of that error and one over four of that error. So that's how we get the error contribution of each of those nodes and make us know how we can update the weights. So it's the same procedure. That's how we keep going backward and all. Like I've said, this was it here. The weight of that layer over the total weight of that particular layer. The weight of that node over the total weight, which is like three over three plus one. But like they've said here, if you notice, 
they actually found a way to just eliminate it because it's actually going to give you the same penalization that we needed. Yeah, so this, this is what I was trying to say, that the error of that particular hidden layer would be that width multiplied by the error. So that's more like what they did here, if you check it. Um, what was I? Yeah. So yeah, that's what they did. They multiplied the width. Um, was it? No, no, not this. We multiplied the width here, which is the width, by the error function. So it's exactly the same thing that is here. Multiplying the width by it. So what they just did was that, if you notice now, they didn't um, they didn't do the width all over the total width in this place here. They didn't do the width all over the total width. What they just did was that they just multiplied the width by the error. Later on in the book, they explained that they explained what I already said that it does not really matter that it still give you the same thing. So that's why they just admitted the denominator. Then to just be the error multiplied by the width itself. So you just admit the error. So the whole transpose thing is just based on how you want to multiply it and how you want to split them. So the error would then be the weight transpose multiplied by the error. That's the error of that hidden layer will be the output error multiplied by the weight transpose, which is exactly what they did here. So you can just use that book to understand how all these backpropagation aspects work. Then for the calculation now, you know, calculation is based on the particular loss function we're using. I'll try and share the, you know, the book I wrote like that, that I proved all those values in. But like I've said, for this, for this particular notebook I'm explaining, it's not really about the network itself, but it's about the gaining of those features that we need for our, um, for our sentiment classification. So now, if you notice now, uh, like I've said, it, it took a while for us to train. If you can look at the timing now, so it, it, it took it one second per review. So it was actually very slow in training. So there are two things involved now. The first is the fact that it was slow in training. Look at this one, 103.2 for training. And the accuracy is very bad. So what can we say about this now? Now, the, the, if the, I don't know if you know Andre Capacity. So there's one guy that's into around, um, NLP, deep learning for NLP. So he was one I was trying to explain that if you use this method now, Remember we're keeping, we're doing counts for every word that appear. So if you had a review now, let's just say if you had a review, let me, let me just try and do this. If you had a review and we had indexes, so these indexes are like, these indexes are, let's just say these are full corpus, these are full vocabulary, and these are indexes. And we had a review, we are going through each of the reviews. So let's just say for a single review now, Space, which is definitely going to be the most occurring thing, appeared like 50 times. Space appeared 50 times. Um, and good, the word good, or let's just say fantastic. Since we are using, um, since fantastic, fantastic is going to um, it's going to mean more for a positive review. Fantastic occurred once in that particular review. Then comma appeared, okay, comma appeared like, let's just say 20 times. Then, let me use and that thing now. D appeared, does C, H, E appeared like 10 times now. So this first one is space. You know why it's an index represent them? This first one is space. This one is um, fantastic. This one is comma, let me move this. And this one is D. From what we've seen now, we've seen that if you ask, if you initialize each of these variables like this, that's because we're keeping the counts. If you check, if you check what we did initially when we're training, we're keeping counts. That's the essence of this um, plus one here. So whenever we find it in our review, we'll add one to it. We'll keep adding one. So because of that, let's just assume we kept on adding one, and we then had this as our input with fifty. Space, one fantastic, which is very important, 20, um, comma, and 10 D. Now, this would confuse our network a lot because these things don't even contribute at all. If you look at it now, 50 is space, and space does not tell us whether something is um, a negative or a positive review, but it's occupying a lot of weight here. 
if you had 50 in this place here, let's just say another input, this was 50, 50 was here, and multiply 50 by any of those are weights, it means that 50 will contribute a lot to the, to the error, and therefore it should be getting updated based on that particular one. So this will just make our network, it will make our neural network noisy. That's the whole point of uh, what they call neural noise. So it will make our neural network noisy. And we won't be able to get important features that we need. So that's why what they did was that, so the next thing that they did now is that, um, let me delete this since we need this. What they did next is that instead of us just using it, if you look at it now, for this example now, for this first input now, which is review, let's just say the first review, which was at index zero. When we pass it into our this our update input layer, remember this is what we're doing, we're adding one to it. When we pass it, we realize that our layer zero contains 18 for space. And some other important things will be occurring like ones. So we do not want those noise, especially in things that are not important. So the way to solve it is to change this from plus equals to, to just equals to, so that whenever something occurs, it will just record it as the fact that it has occurred. So it will just be one for everything. So that's what they did. So the essence of this is just make sure that we do not have like things that will contribute. So it will be a neutral contribution thing. Not that something that is very unnecessary will be taking a lot of space or weight, that kind of thing. So they wanted to eliminate it, so they use that. Now let's look at it. Now exactly, so this makes sense. If you look at the review counter with respect to when we added one, if you see now, we realize that dot contains 27, space contained 18, which is what we saw here. So even dot was more than space. Um, D contained nine, two contained six. And these are things that are not really helpful at all. And they are contributing a lot. So while the things that are important, we're taking like two, one, or even mostly one, insightful one. So what we just did is that instead of us incrementing them, we can just assign one to one to it once. So we also know that, okay, it's either it's contributing or it's not contributing. Zero means that it didn't appear. One means that it appeared. So what we'll do now next is just modify that part of the code. When we modify that part of the code, we make sure that we are removing neural noise. So this thing does not actually improve the accuracy. Rather, it does not improve the, the training speed, but it just increases the accuracy because now we've been, we've been able to eliminate neural noise. So now if you do that now, let's look at it. The only part we're changing is this part, which is our updating pit layer. So this time around, we're not going to be adding the number of times those words occurred in the, in the review, but we just add only one to mean that it occurred. Zero means that it did not occur, that kind of thing. So now when you run it now, um, why would this one still training? But you can see that in our test, we saw that the accuracy increased to 84.2. So initially, if you look at the formal accuracy, um, where was it? Okay, let me just use this. But the accuracy was 61.1. .1. And now after we've removed our noise, the accuracy has increased much more. So now you can see that it's still training and it's already 73.4. That's because we removed noise. At the end, if you run this final one, you have it's 2.2. So now that's something we've done. We've been able to make sure that we're feeding the right things to our network. So now the next thing that we'll now look at is now analyzing inefficiencies in our network. So this inefficiency aspect is to make our neural network train faster. Now to explain this part, if you look at if you look at it now, if you look at our network, we had places that we had variables that had zeros. First time, sorry. Okay, we had places. You know, in our inputs, zero means that zero means that that particular index or that particular word did not occur in that review. Do we agree with that? Let me just be sure that we understand how that our input layer works. Do we agree with what I just said? Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, so it means that wherever we check our reviews, we we'll have places that have zeros. Now, those zeros will signify that those words do not occur in that particular review. But the point is that these things are actually, they're actually still occupying space in our neural network. If you multiply zero by everything now, because you know how the neural network thing works, that you, you multiply every part of this layer by every other part here. So this part multiply by this, this part multiply by this, this part multiply by this, and this multiply by this. But if you have zero here, 
zero multiply everything and will still give zero. So it's almost not contributing at all. So you just have like unnecessary space that don't have anything to do with real network training. The same thing is this part here. Zero will just be occupying space, but the only one that contributes is one. So what we can do now is to make sure that it's only the ones that have one that would contribute to it. So you can see your prices are actually still increasing. Now, let's look at an example here. So if you have a layer zero, now let's just say this is simple layer zero. So this layer zero has 10, that's, it has a length of um, a shape of one comma 10, one by 10. Now, uh, this guy almost done. Now, okay, if you print this, we just have zeros. So we just want to have ones in two places, which is as index four and index nine. Now, if you put ones in this place, it means that these are the only places or these are the only indexes where words in that particular review or code. So that's just like an assumption. Now, if you print our layers, we see one at index four and one at index nine. If you create our weights now, these weights will have to make sure that they must work. So to have 10 rows and five columns, it means I want to have five as our outputs. Now, when we create this our initial as our random width, when we multiply this by this, we have an array of this. These are our array outputs. Now, these are array outputs. When we multiply everything by this, we got this as our value. Now, another way to do this thing now is that we just store the indices. So the indices is that one occurred at index four and occurred at index nine. So those are the only places where parts of the reviews or code. What we can now do is that we'll create our layer one as npz dot distance zero five. You know, you know um, when you multiply our width by this thing, then you know you can do it like this thing. Let me just call this layer one. Layer underscore one is equals to this. Then if I print out layer one, oh this guy is still training. So this, this is really one of the issues I was talking about. The fact that these unnecessary things are making it very slow. So that is very, very slow. But I think I'll just have to translate. Even if it's almost done. Um, okay. So, if I run this, um, so if this is layer one here, this is what we got as our output here. If you notice this layer one, based on the matrix multiplication, yes, you should expect shape five as our output. That's um, one by five as our output of layer one. So now the alternative to do this thing is to actually just manipulate our, our uh, matrix multiplication. Now, look at this thing, and let me try and draw it. I hope I can draw it well. If you have, if you have an array of this, let's just say one comma zero, no, this is not fine. One comma zero comma one. Then multiplied by, let's just say, um, a, Dot, 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 dot. Okay, let me just say two. Let me just use two places. B and B. B and C and C. If you have something like this now, I want to do matrix multiplication. Now, one multiply this A, zero multiply this B, one multiply this C. Note. One multiply this A, zero multiply this B, and one multiply this C. But what you notice is that one will always get, will always multiply this place. This one always multiply this place. This one always multiply. It means that you can actually just say that the value you have in A is one multiplied by everything here. That's, you know, based on this, you can actually just say that our output, you know, these are our output here. These still are output. Here, these are outputs. Uh, mm, I'll just use O to represent our output. Let's just say these are outputs here. 
then we can say that this particular side here, this particular place that is A, is just one multiplied by this and multiplied by this. Do we do you agree with that? One multiplied by A and A would give us this particular place here. Zero multiplied by B and B will give us this output here. One multiplied by C and C will give us this output. Do you agree with that? Or does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yes, it, it means that yeah, so it means that this one is what is contributing to every output we have here. Then because of that now we can just because of this in intuition, we can know that whatever we get as this B would be as a result of this zero. And because this is zero, we will always expect that this B will be zero. So what we can do now is that this of us going through everything that zeros, we just go to the places in our inputs where we have one, and then our output will just be that one multiplied by it. So we just multiply one by the width for that particular row. So at this place now, you know this is um, index zero. So I'll just say one multiplied by width index zero. So that's exactly what's happening here. So now we have our indices. So at index four and nine, that's where we have places that we have one. So now we can then create a zeros. So our layer one will just be set of zeros. So which is this now? Our layer one will just be set of zeros. Based on our output, we expect that our layer one will have one by five. That's why we can just create it as this. We can just initialize it with zeros. What we're going to do is that we're going to fill it up. We're not going to do it normal conventional matrix classification method. We're going to use this method I just explained now. So now what we're going to do is that we'll go through each of the indices. So for the indices now at indices four, at indices four, let's just say this was at index four. It means that at index four, multiply one by the rule index um, index four's rule. So let's just say this is one, two, three, and a fourth one. So it means that index four rule, multiply one by everything there. Now, so that's what exactly is happening here. So for indices in for index and indices, layer one will just increment it. Like what we just did is that it will be one multiplied by that width. The reason why is, this is one is because of one. It, it is, it's because we you know we are saying that we're not using count again, we're not using number of occurrences, we're just using one to represent places that occurred. So that's why it's like this. So you can just after you just remove this one and put it like this, because you are multiplying one, one by need to give you the value itself. So what is what this is happening is that we'll just be creating our layer based on only those indices. So that's what's happening here. So for the first one now, so what what's just happening is that at this point now, because one is one and is contributing, so it means that at index zero, I'll update it, which is what's happening here. I'll update it based on the index zero. This is zero here, so you just keep it and go to the next one. So this one is at index two. So it will now come here and go to the third row and update it. So it's updated at this point. So that's how it's working. So this time around, we do not need, now we've emitted the whole point of having zeros. Now we're just going to update our weights for the places that are not zero. We're not going to be doing multiplication for those other zero ones. So when we do this now, we then have exactly the same thing. If you print it now, you look at it, the output we get when we do this is exactly the same output we get when we do this. That's because those zeros are not contributing anything, but we're just making our neural network larger. So now we've been able to eliminate that inefficiency aspect. Now, this is the intuition behind it. So what we then do is to then apply it in our neural network, in our uh, network structure itself. So like I've said, you can just remove that one multiplied by, it was just for you to understand what was happening, but basically one multiplied by any value you give itself. So you have this. So now for making our neural network efficient, so there are just a few key things that will change. So my other ones are the same. Now for our preprocess side now, I think it changed over here. Um, okay, no, this preprocess didn't change here. It was now our um, next network. Okay. Uh, here, yeah. So. For our training now, now for our training, we do not need this thing. 
um, for our training, we do not need, you know what we did here? Let me just go back to the initial training that we did, that we had this function. If you check it, we had this update input layer. So this function was what was adding ones, it was what was giving ones to places where, um, was giving ones to places where we had occurrences. So those index where they occurred in that particular review, we add one to it. But in this case now, we're not going to do such. So what we're going to do now is, um, is this it? Yeah, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a, a list now for those training reviews. So what's going to happen is that for review in that training review role, so this training review role is our main reviews. These are our main reviews data sets. We're going to, I trace each of the review in our main review data sets. Then indices is now going to contain the index where those ones occurred. So this time around, indices is just going to be, um, it's going to be a set that contain the location of those words that occurred in that particular review. So this time around, they're not going to keep space for the ones that did not occur. I'm just going to keep space for only the ones that occurred. So it means that if you go through these indices, it means that we're, we're only looking at places that occurred. There's nothing like zero here. So when we have that indices now, it's going to be set. We're going to go through each word in the review. Now, each word in the review definitely means that the word occurred in that review. Then word in, if the word is in, we already know this condition, that if it's in the total review that we have, the, the total number of words, the total words that occurred in the review, if it's there, then now it means that we want to add that word to our indices for that particular review. So now if you have a review, we're going to have indices. So for each review now, we're just going to have only spaces where um, they occurred. Now the whole point of this, doing this words to index word is to get the index. When we get the index, we then add it to, the, in, to this indices um, set. So this indices set is just going to store the indexes of those words in that review. So if you notice, for me to be storing indexes of those words in that review, it means that I'm just storing the places where words occurred in that review. I'm not going to have those extra spaces again. I hope you get what I mean. Then when we've done this, we can then append it to our training review. So now this our training review list is now going to be an equivalent of these training reviews, but this time around it's just having the indexes of all those words uniquely that occurred in this training reviews row. If I print it out, let me um, do this here. Print training underscore reviews. Reviews. So I, when we're trying to look at this, so we can see that this thing is almost the same as this, but the whole point is that it's just containing only places where, um, it's containing only places where what in that review occurred. So I'm not going to have those zeros again at all. So you will soon see the essence of doing this now. Once we've set that, we can then look through our training reviews. This time we're not looking through the reviews data set again, we're looking through these our training reviews. Then we'll get our review and we'll get our label. Now we can then do that thing that we said. So we have our layer one, then we'll now do for indexing reviews because these are the indexes that gave us that one not zero again so we won't have anything like zero again this is just like already so initially so we're going to go through each of those indexes because definitely this one's representing that review when we go to the indexes we we'll then do what we already said we we'll use this procedure here where we we'll multiply this by everything here so which is what they did here um you know you know this is one so definitely we don't need to write we could have just written one multiplied by everything but definitely we don't need to do one multiplied again I'm just going to multiply, um, sorry, I'm just going to be getting each of these values by themselves. So now once we've done this, we've, we've finally succeeded in emulating those zero things. So the rest is now equal, the rest is the same thing. That's the creation of our um, layer two side, getting our error, getting our error term, back propagating, but there's one part where something now changed. Now, when we now want to start updating with for that particular side, which is, okay, not here. But when we want to start updating the weights for that particular node, now, we cannot use um, the normal method that we're using for updating, like this here. We cannot use this method. 
all we did to do is that we need to go through each of those indexes again because those are the indexes we want to update. We don't really care much about every other ones. It's just those indexes specifically we want to update. So we'll go through those indexes again. Then the wait for those indexes is now where we're going to um, perform the backup addition. That's what I'm going to do our weight update. So we're only going to update weights for those particular layers, which are this one. For instance, this A, we're going to update for A because it is part of our indexes. We're going to update C because it's part of our index. But B is not, so we we'll ignore this one. So that's just different things of them. Now, if I run this now, um, let me see. We're still building this. Okay, just a start train really. Um. It means that now it has become faster because we've eliminated those unnecessary parts. So now we'll have equally the same accuracy, but at a faster period since we've gotten rid of those unnecessary things once that we, that we saw in that place. So that's how the trading will be. Then we realize that we'll get almost the same thing. Now, the last part which we're going to talk about now is now some one part that is actually very, very going to be important when we're building like sentiment analysis. Um, or basically working with X data. After this, I'll then go then take us through. I don't know if you've heard of NLTK, but it's this natural language processing toolkit. It's quite old, but like that's really one I kind of have an idea of how it works. But there are other newer methods that we can use that will actually give you better um, procedures. But before that, now what this further noise um, reduction side, what it's trying to tell us now is that, let me see how this one is training. Okay, it's still training. Okay, it doesn't finish training. You can see it was far, far faster than the other one. Much more faster. Now, what this one is trying to say is that if you look at this now, positive ratio must come on. These are things that contribute a lot to our positive side. Okay. Then negative ones, these are the ones that contribute a lot. It's just that I don't have this particular thing here. I don't have this particular, um, this particular library. But I think it's on Colab. So if you run this Pascal notebook on Colab, you should be able to see this plot. But the essence of this thing now, what they are trying to tell us is that if you, what the plot was trying to show us was that, first of all, there are some words. It shows a histogram. So that histogram, what it shows is that there are some words in that place that are a lot. They, they occur a lot. You know, what we need to do now is that if you have, um, let me just try and search for something like this. Um, Gaussian yeah, so if you have something like this now, if you have a Gaussian plot like this, let me see something this is quite clear. If you have a Gaussian plot like this now, the whole point of this this um, analysis thing and how we are going to build our network is the fact that we have values that are close to zero. And most of the time, these ones occur a lot. So remember what we said, that if you had values of zeros, the ones that occur around the zeros are things that are neutral. So things that are neutral are not really important. So you'll be seeing things like space, comma, D, um, walls, and all those things don't really contribute to our, um, our sentiment. It doesn't contribute to what we are trying to do. But the ones that contribute to it are things that are um, sloppy, like this part here, this cute part, this part that went towards the side and this part are going towards the side. So, so things that are going towards the side based on what we already did is that we are seeing um, positive reviews and the ones that are going towards the side are negative reviews. So what we can do is to eliminate these ones at the top here because these ones too are making our stuff inefficient. So imagine training our network on things that are not really relevant. So it, it, just, um, it just gives the neural network a lot but what I'm trying to do is to generate features, important features. So what we can do is to eliminate this one here. So that's what this next part is talking about. So they, they actually did it manually here. Let me just explain the code here. 
Let me look for the parts where those changes were made. But if you look at where the changes now, you know, remember when we did the um, negative positive to negative ratio thing? This is actually the code here where we create our positive counts, create our negative counts, create our total counts, and then find the negative and positive to negative ratio. So when we get this, we have mean that we have positive values are greater than zero, negative values are less than zero, neutral values are within zero, just within zero range. So that's what we just did now. You notice that there's a change here. Um, here you could use this method where you just um, find negative log of one over the ratio plus 0 0.01, or you could use the initial one I did from the beginning. The only they definitely will give you the same thing, whichever one you want. But the whole point is just to make sure that the positive side. Uh, let me look for it. It's just to make sure that we have. Um, sorry, wait. wait. Just to make sure that we have positive side greater than zero and negative side less than zero. I'm trying to look for this thing. Find log. Wow, I see there's so many logs here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. What does it be? Yeah, it should be here. Yeah, so this is what I did. Just using np.log ratios, this will help us um, split them together. You could just use this one, or you could use the other one that is there. So it just makes sure there's no difference between both of them. Now, now we have this. The condition we can now do are two sets of conditions. The first one now is that when we are splitting our words, when we are creating our vocabulary, we want our vocabulary to contain only important things and things that should contribute to any of those sentiments. So now, first of all, we should have a minimum count. So this minimum count is just trying to know how many times each of the value will occur before we can consider it. So you can specify the minimum count. That's just based on your choice, depending on what you want to do. So after doing this now, the next thing we now do is our polarity cutoff. So this polarity cutoff now is now what now make us um, know which ones are neutral. So this one helps us eliminate those things that if you look at this distribution, it helps us mix and identify these ones that are here. So you can identify them as anyone that is less than 0 0.1 and anyone that is greater than 0 0.1 and less than 1. So you can use that as a polarity code. So in this case, now what they did was that any value that is greater than, that if these are points negative ratio words, so if it's greater than or equals to this, or the point when negative ratio is less than, or equals to negative of the price ratio. That's when we we'll consider it. So this means that those values that are within this polarity cutoff value, so anyone that is within that range would be cut off, while the ones that are either greater than or less than. You can always you can almost identify that what they mean is that anyone that is greater than this priority ratio means that it is a positive one. And anyone that is less than this means that it is a negative ratio. So we just want to make use of only those ones to train our network. So that's how we then create our vocabulary. So this makes us know important part of our vocabulary. I, I think I, there was something I wanted to print before and I forgot. Oh, surprise it didn't print. Okay, but in this part here, if I could print it, it would make sense. So we can see our vocabulary. Why in length of review? Um, here. Print vocabulary. Vocabulary. So this just makes us um, identify only things. So the whole point of this one now. Um, where is it? The whole point of that thing was to just make sure that it eliminates things. So I can almost guess that something like full stop or space or A or D, those ones will be eliminated because those ones are before within that neutral range. So that's the whole essence of this type. Oh, I should have done it this way. But let me just cancel this thing. It's going to take quite a while. But the whole point is that our vocabulary is going to contain only important things. Let me just remove it. 
I've, I've never recontained just important things. That's your point. So if you train now, now you set up WM vocabulary cutoff to be this. Once you set it, it means that anything that is greater than um anything that's greater than 0 0.05 should be considered the positive one. Anything that is less than minus 0 0.05 should be considered a negative one. So anyone that falls within that range between minus 0 0.05 and 0 0.05 should be ignored. So we won't add it to our vocabulary. That's what it just means. Then when you run it, you realize that you still get almost the same accuracy. And this makes sense too, and it helps. So you've seen that we've gotten, we've eliminated unnecessary things too. And if you see that the training speed is, fast, is much faster too. Then also what we need to know is that we can actually still modify it. At this point, they use polarity cutoff of 0 0.8. In this, at this point here, the accuracy, um, the speed actually, it became faster but the accuracy dropped a bit the accuracy dropped a bit to like 82 points so while this one was um why this one was it's 5.9 so those, those are just the pre-processing steps you can actually do to improve your um text feature generation Oof. So, like, do you have any questions at all? If I just show us one last thing using the NLT key. Do you have any questions at all? For now, no. Me, no. Okay, okay. Um, I'll just okay. While this is done, I'll just um like go through one Twitter Twitter sentiment analysis thing I did before. But before that, like I just want us to show us what you can do with NLTK. So what this NLTK does is that it's just this natural language toolkit, natural language processing toolkit. So it helps us process our text data, that kind of thing. I think I'll share it because I can't really remember. Yeah, there are many functions actually. So there's tokenization. Tokenization is converting your words to, um, is, is it converting? Yeah, tokenization just means splitting it. So it just creates an array. It's similar to what we already did. We did it manually, but what, what this just does is that if you pass a, a um, data or a text data like this, if you pass something like this inside this tokenizer, it should split every word. If you notice, we already did this thing by ourselves. So you can just use this function with NLTK. So it will split every word into, it will split the words and create a, a list of every word in that particular sentence. So that's what that um, tokenizer does. Then you can also find this frequency distribution, which is what you already did by ourselves. You can try it by yourself or use something like this library. So it will give you all the counts for each of them. So you can do that most common too. We already did it using that counter function. You can do most common, then, there are many other things you can do. So this is a um, bigram and tigram thing. What it does, if I can remember correctly. Uh, okay, this is, I can't remember the essence of this particular bigram thing, but it speaks, basically just splits words into like the word, the first word and the next word, then the next word and the next one, then that one and the next one, something like this. But these are just things that are very important things. NLP. So this this bigram and diagram. I've never had any reason to use this one. Then stemming now is another one. So what stemming does is that if you are you are working with this text data, you can have multiple occurrences where you can have multiple cases where someone used a word in four different forms or more than just one different form, like have, having, had, all those things. It still means the same thing, but it doesn't make sense to have a, a vocabulary where you have having, you have have, you have had in the same vocabulary and they tend to have different, um, what they call it, indexes. It's best to just make sure that all those kind of things just have one meaning because definitely it has one meaning. To have something means to possess something. If you had something, it means you possessed it. So it's just meaning, it just basically means the same thing. So you can see for have, it will just um, bring a summarized version of it. If you put have in, to give you the summarized form. If you if you give an example like this, give, giving, giving, give. 
all of them will give you the same thing. Although it seems like giving didn't give the same as give. But the point is that giving is to give. Give is to um, give. Yeah, there's, there's this stuff that is, um, I can't remember what they call it, but this, this function here, they help us, um, they, they use it to know how well you want to penalize it. So you can see there's LST, there's PSP, but I can't remember all of them. But what it does, does is that it makes, it just gives a summary of all of them. There are some of them that will actually give you the same thing as give. Then lemmatization, I can't remember what it is, but um, yeah, lemmatization is still similar to it too, but I can't remember the whole point of it. But I think you can, I'll share this notebook so you can just go through it. But all these things are just used in pre-processing our um, input, our input text. Then this is just a function of the whole NLP thing. These are just things you can use it for. Then the main one I want to show is just the sample Twitter sentiment analysis using Twitter data. So this was what I was talking about. So I used NLTK2 and some other things. First of all, you get the Twitter, um, what they call it, the Twitter data set. So these are negative tweets, these are positive tweets. So first of all, you can get your positive tweets from our distance, from our positive tweet of JSON. You can see the length is 5,000. You can get a negative tweet. Then now, when you then look at it, these are just a sample of the tweets and the positive tweets. That's just the first five. Now look at it. We want to know if a tweet is positive or negative, but you can see there are quite a lot of noise. Now you can see hashtag follow Friday, hashtag France this, at this, at this, for being top against member in my committee this week. Now this, as a human being, I can tell that this is a positive tweet. I can tell that this is a positive tweet, but if you want to pass it to a network now, I can almost be certain that all these things here don't actually matter. That they don't tell us the, they don't tell us if they don't give us information of the kind of three species. But when you then come around and start seeing things like um, engaged top means it's tending towards positive tweet. But this is how the network discovers those patterns. Now, for if I look at the second one now, at lambda, whatever, it's not really important. Please contact and we'll be able to assist you. Many thanks. All these things will give us a direct positive tweet. As you bleed, is a missing track. Uh, even as a human being, I don't know what this one is trying to say. Then this one is here, yeah, EP. My account verified request. So all these ones, we can just see to know. So now the next thing to do is to then clean our tweets. So with NLTK, you can actually do those things I mentioned. Now stop words now. Stop words are things like full stop. Um, not just full stop. I don't think I have NLTK on this my system here. But you can go through this. Um, stop words to see example of stop words. Let me look for it here. Stop words are like um, NLTK stop words. So I'm look for an example where they put it. Print stop. Wow, this guy didn't explain it. And yeah, so this this makes sense. I'm trying to move this. So you can see this is how you see all the stop words. So stop words are like I, me, myself, we. So all these words don't really contribute to those sentiments. So with this library, we can come across all these things that are important. Instead of us manually doing it by ourselves, like we did in the other one, where we had to like do the positive negative counts and then eliminate those other ones. We just kind of image those ones that we know for certain don't contribute at all. So that's the first thing here. Um, where is it? Yeah, so for the cleaning of the tweets, first of all, we have to go through and make sure that our data set contains things that are not in these stop words. So first of all, we want to eliminate stop words. Now we want to apply that stemma. If you check that stemma thing that I showed you, so this stem in here, um, okay. This is stop. Oh, I already even printed it here. So these are stop words in English here. Then for the stemming aspects, you can see what stemming is. Like we already said, it's to summarize everything like this to just a single word. So that's the whole point of using this stemma. We're going to use this stemma. Then we're going to tokenize it. Tokenizing it means converting it from a sentence to an array of each word. Then also we're going to use this 
to remove all those emoticons, those um, like smiley. If you look at this particular tweet here, this guy is smiley, but we don't need the smiley. So this is going to help us remove those things. So these are basically noise, emoticon size, sad. You can use this to remove those ones too. So for cleaning the tweets now, you can use regular expression. So this will first remove things like dollar sign. Um, is this dollar sign? Mm. Remove stock market tweets like this. Okay, yeah, like things like this. You can remove this. Then you can remove like this retweet thing here. I will see. Then you can remove links too. People that tag links, you can remove it because all these things all contribute to the Twitter sentiment. Then you can remove hashtag too. You can try to remove the full hashtag or you can just try to remove this. Because sometimes I think some hashtags signify or are very important to some Twitter sentiment. So you can actually just leave the values themselves and just remove away the hashtag and remove like things like ask too. So we we'll remove things like this, we we'll remove hashtag, then we we'll replace space comma with comma, replace space dot with dot. Then we can tokenize, this tokenizing, like we've said already, tokenizing helps us um, change everything from our sentence format to an array of each word. Then from there, we can then pass it and then make sure that we remove all those things. So the essence is that if word not in stop word and word not in emoticon and word not in this, then it means this basically means that we're only picking words that do not exist in any of these things here. Then we can then apply our stemma just to make sure that it's, and if we come across any word like give or give or giving, it will just give us just a simple output. Then we can then append this to our new clean tweet. So this is our new clean tweet to now contain things like this. Now if you look at this, this is RT um, at Twitter, at Champagne, at Hello, and this. So we've removed unnecessary things. We then finally have this. Hello, great day, good morning. So now with this, you can almost be certain that our model, our network writer, would be able to use these important things to make predictions. Now this is another one here. When we clean this, we'll have one irresistible and flip card fashion Friday. So the point is that these ones are things that will most likely contribute to the sentiment. So you can see that these are just basically extracting features for us. Then um this is the bag of um, bag of words method but let's just ignore it the point is that once you already have something like this once you have this kind of clean suite you can pass it into a neural network this one is now that um, another um algorithm on its own but we don't actually need to use this algorithm this one is using naive base classifier but if we use our neural networks once we've gotten this as our total um as our new tweet data set we can then pass this into our neural network at this point and you get you actually get a good result that's the whole point so the point is that we'll be able to clean our data sets and remove unnecessary things that we don't need and do not contribute to our data so does that make sense or do you have any questions or confusions again makes sense oh okay So from, from next week, okay, what we just did now is that we just used a single neural network, like a normal simple NLP, mostly a perception network to classify those tweets. But like I've said, the most important part of this NLP team is how we can convert our text data to, um, to inputs that neural network and understand. Like that is the most important part of it. Then, you know, if you look at what we just did here, we actually built it from scratch. If you notice, we, we like built our neural network from scratch. You can actually just try it by yourself. You can try it by yourself. You can do the same procedures for cleaning. And then once you've cleaned it, you can pass it into our normal PyTorch method, our PyTorch to linear function for classification. You can, with that, you can actually still build, you can build um, wider um, layers. You can build with multiple layers and deeper networks, that kind of thing. So that's why I said we should not really try and focus on the neural network side, even though it's important, but more of how we're able to clean data sets. So the first stage was first of all, the fact that we just, um, we're counting the number of occurrences of each word 
in that re in each review for each review we count total number of words and after counting total number of words we we'll then um pass it into our network we we'll pass the counts so the thing is that we discovered that it was actually affecting the performance of our model because unnecessary words like full stop space comma were taking a lot those ones were taking a lot of weight and precedence over important things so how we tackle it was by converting it to like it's rather not converting was from changing from um, the count to just representing um, appearance as either one or zero, where one means it is present in that review, zero means it is absent in that review. So after we did that, the accuracy increased significantly because it was no more noisy. And the next thing was now starts removing inefficiencies. So we are removing inefficiencies is basically the first thing that we did was to discover that we didn't need to. Um, like those zeros that we're multiplying, uh, we're, we're making use of zeros. And those zeros we're multiplying and giving unnecessary weight. So when you multiply zero by anything, you have zero. So we're just making use of zeros that were not necessary at all. So what we needed to do at that point was to eliminate those parts that had zeros. So once we had those parts that had zeros, um, when we had them removed, it made our network train faster. Then after that, the next thing that we finally did was to then remove those ones that were not contributing. So what we just did basically was exactly the cleaning process, which we saw in that NLTK method. Even though it's much more easier with NLTK, there's another one I think is spicy. Spicy is under um, down that tool for exactly for doing exactly the same thing. So let me let me see. Um, sweet, Pytorch two thousand analysis. So this is same sentence analysis using Pytorch, but this time around you use sentiment analysis using the current neural network and um, LSTM. So those ones are much better because like I've said, it does, it pays attention to things like irony. You know, this one now, basically what it, does, what it does is that it just uses the ones that occur most frequently to know it. Oh no, this, this, and this keras. No, sorry. So um, what I was saying was that, the, this one we just did was just using important things to know. But when you start using LSTM or recording your network for the same sentiment analysis, it should pay attention to um, to the previous words. So there'll be like a form of feedback. So that's what makes all this, the, that recording your network side, a sequential model. So it pays attention to previous, it uses past to, pre to, pre to, pre to predict the future. So that is very, very useful when you are working with time series data. So it performs very well. So this is what I was saying. This is spacey now. This spacey does exactly the same thing as NLTK. It's a more modern framework for search. So like I've said, this is the data set. Um, these are tweets too. It's similar to the other one. But these are the same tweets. Then from there, you can use um, that spacey to add. Um, let me go to the point where we start pre-processing. So this is the same pre-processing aspect. It's still very similar. It's still very similar, but at that point, you start using spacey now. Spacey is much faster than um, NLTK. So you can use spacey to clean your data and some other things. I honestly can't even remember all these things again. Well, basically, I think for now, we should just try and read about that NLTK. I'll share this NLTK um, notebook with us. I'll share it with us. But first of all, we actually need to install the NLTK library. I don't know if it's, it automatically comes with Colab. Let me try and see it. I think it's coming to collab by default. But if it doesn't, it's not hard. It's just keep install NLTK. That's all. Okay, cool. It actually comes with this thing. It comes with um collab, so you can run it. This index out of range. Oh, it does this. Right. Import. Sure. Let me show that this thing's working. Ah, it's in the folder right now, so. Um. Okay, I think I have to go through that documentation again, but it seems they've changed quite a lot of things. Let me see. Oh, 
Wow, man, things have changed quite a lot. I need to get that corpus. Okay, what I'll do, I think I'll have to go through this stuff again. That's through the uh, um, documentation and make those changes. And I'll take here. Make sure that this one's having okay. Oh. Mm. Make sure that this is okay. Again, that's what the knives are. Oh, yeah, that's true. Ah, shit. Yeah, I was supposed to do this first. There's a way to download the NLTK. Um, there's something to download. I thought it's just a story, it isn't good. I saw it. Um, download this one more thing to download. Yeah, this. Sure, how this works. Put some modules on like the same thing as then. Download the uh oh, I'm confused. Okay, what else we thought? I think I'll just try and do this thing offline. Later on. Well, like so far, do you understand what like we've done so far? Because I know it can be confusing to an extent. Okay, what I want us to try and do is that, like based on what we already did, I want us to try and um, implement like the same thing, still the same reviews, um, the same reviews data sets. I also try and use like this library, this NLTK library, and first to first clean our data sets. So after cleaning our data sets, we can then pass it through our network. But this time around, let us pass it through like a normal PyTorch linear network. So we just pass it through our PyTorch um, linear network and then get our output prediction. Is something we can do. 
or do you have like any confusing aspect of that? Yeah, I'm not hearing what you say. Like, it's something you can do. Uh, uh, hopefully, if we, if we go through the uh, notebook and the example, we might try it out. Mm. Okay, but if I put the procedures, if I should say procedures, first of all, like the NLT case um, side, what we just need the NLT case part is just for um, two things that's standing that I mentioned. So like I'll try and fix this thing because I can't remember how I started this thing out the first time. After, um, I'll first I'll try and do that. But basically for NLTK, what we just need the NLTK to do for us is to first of all do that stemming aspect to make sure that we don't have words that are repeating themselves. Like boy, this time around in terms of tenses like past tense or future tense, stuff like that. So things like going, gone, go, to help us sort out things like that. So we don't have a very large corpus. It will help us source something like that. Then also it help us remove those stop words. So you can check out um, how to remove stop words with NLTK. Or I might just share the function too. I'll try and arrange everything. So we can use NLTK just for just those, those pre-processing aspects. Then for our network, what we just need to do is to, once we present, is we're able to present our data in terms of, um, in our text data in terms of values or numbers. Once we're able to achieve that, we can just pass it into our neural network, our, our normal multi perception network, that's our linear layer, and get our output prediction. Once we're able to do that, then we're fine. That's all. So hopefully we'll be able to try it. I also try my hands on this too. Then maybe next week we'll just share what we know about or what we we'll are able to do. So that's it. Then if you have any like questions when you go through the material, you can ask me, you can like um, say it on the Slack or you can message me privately. Okay. But next week, um, we'll start more of the NLP side and it's wherever that we'll be taking it, like I said. All right. So I think that's the end. What's the time? All right. Uh, thank you, Stanley. Yeah, thanks everyone. So have a nice day. Yes. All right, goodbye. Bye. Bye.